Hi again. Um, we had some great questions last night on the on the webinar. Um, obviously, when I'm running it, it's very very hard to, to answer those questions. And um, you know, anybody that knows me would know that I'd be um, happy to carry on till midnight. But um, uh, the, the the stress of getting it out there um, is. Um, is a bit uh, stuff that's a bit tricky, so I had to sort of stop. And uh, we've got the questions emailed to us as part of that software package, so I'm happy to go through some of those now. So, um, one of the questions was from Claire Cullen: uh, Why do um, other disciplines dismiss the importance of fascia? Um, I don't think they necessarily dismiss the importance of fascia; rather, than necessarily they just don't know the importance of fascia. Um, and even from my perspective. Um, I'm not going to say that fascia is any more important um, than any one other tissue. And I think it's very, um, it's very important that we don't focus and obsess about one bit of a body, um, which I think has been the tendency to happen with fascia uh, a little bit over the years. And it concerns me that you know, we're, we're, we're obsessing about fascia rather than necessarily um, bringing it into the discussion of everything else. So. Um, is it important? Yes, it's a connective tissue. All connective tissues are important. We need to know more about it. We need to get uh, more description about it. Um, and we certainly need to not dismiss it. Um, but um, I, I'm, I'm questioning as to why anybody would think it's more important than anything else. So I think other therapies just need to um, maybe understand it a bit more. Certainly anatomy and physiology tends to dismiss it a little bit. Um, and um, so it's something that it's a poorly described tissue. We need to know more about it. So foundations in um, osteopathic medicine and latest research divides fascia into superficial, deep investing, meningeal and visceral fascia. Are these names synonymous to what you were describing as areola and adipose? Um, the um, areola and adipose would be more the tissues that we'd be looking at superficial and probably visceral fascia. But again, um, visceral fascia, you could also go into the, the sheets of fascia that cover things like the peritoneum and so on and so forth. So um, it, 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 the, the nomenclature doesn't have consensus. We, we, we haven't got an agreement. Um, and there is a, a table somewhere about all the different terms and the names of fascia. Um, and even in relation to superficial fascia, you know, Carlos Decker talks about um, a superficial layer and a deeper layer as far as the, uh, superfi uh, the, the, the fascia, superfici fascia superficialis and um, or, or the cutis layer and, and that is there in the abdomen but it's not there anywhere else and even in the abdomen it's not always there and there'd be reasons why as, as to why it would be the abdomen. We'll talk a bit more about that in the webinar next week on adipose and, and uh, superficial fascia but superficial fascia and adipose would be kind of synonymous because again even though you're going to have varying quantities of both of those at any given point in time uh, you can't really have adipose without a container to put it in. You have to have some kind of holding mechanism for that. Uh, question from Tina Torrell. Um, will we be discussing uh, visceral work and fascia? And uh, yes, we will. We'll be covering that in a future webinar. Um, I'm, I'm a great fan of viscera. There'll be at least two sessions on, on viscera, uh, going over the viscera and, and uh, some of the, its placements and some of the fascia around it, talking about things like the greater momentum, um, which again, very poorly described bit of tissue. So uh, Claire Cullen, do we deposit toxins in adipose as is popularly suggested? Um, I, I'm, I'm always very nervous of the word toxins um, and this idea that um, we have this toxicity. So if we were toxic, then uh, we would be very sick. So the toxicity that we talk about um, is debris. So we have de debris or, or debris, depending on where you, which emphasis you put the syllable on, um, and that debris is moved around. So are there toxins in superficial fascia um, or in adipose? Um, no, I mean, actually, it, technically, an adipocyte is a cell that's a fat cell, so you can't get toxins in it as such. So the idea of there being toxins in adipose, um, you can get buildups of tissue that's not moving freely or fluid that's not moving freely. Would that end up being toxic? Potentially, um, if it didn't move around for any length of time and you got an infection into it, then yes. But toxicity is one of those things I think we have to be careful of and the idea of sort of you know, toxic, toxins coming out or detoxifying something I think is a little bit uh, concerning. So um, uh, I think it's the question that we have almost the, 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 the phrasing of the question and the words within the, to the, 
the, the, the question of like toxins and so on and so forth that are a little bit loaded and, I, and I'm very wary of those things. Mark Sue asked in, in dissection and in um, anatomy why are larger subjects rejected? Um, a lot of this is to do with practicality. So within the um, donation field, if you donate your body, then the university will um, d decline you for a number of reasons. The medical school, um, they could be the, that they're full, that they that they that you died on a weekend. Um, in the case of some universities, that you have some wounds, that you have too much um, scarring or too much, uh, you know, you're too emaciated, um, or that you're too large. You know, if you're t if you're six foot six and and you weigh eighteen stone, then somebody's got to move you around on and off a trolley, uh, put you on a rack, embalm you, and um, so moving people around tends to be um, a, a bit tricky. So generally speaking, what anatomy and what medical students are looking at, and this is really where most uh, body donors go, is to medical students universities, they're looking at um, skinny, dead, skinny, healthy, dead people, and they tend to be elderly, tend to, tend to be small. For our classes, we like those people that are rejected. We like the, the, the donors that um, <clears throat> would otherwise be turned away uh, by the universities for a couple of reasons. One is that we're not then eating into the, uh, the general donor program. We're, we're taking people that would not be otherwise used. Um, secondly, they are very interesting. You know, you get somebody that's big and they have all kinds of other co-issues um, and morbidities and, and it's a really fascinating thing to do to work on somebody that's a bit bigger. Um, we had a, a lady a couple of years ago who was very emaciated and who uh, died on her side and had been lying on her side for two years. Now you couldn't reasonably ask a, a medical student to learn standardized anatomy from that uh, from that donor and uh, but we were absolutely blessed to have her and it's um, it's a wonderful thing to know that we are, are using and granting those donors their, their effectively their last wishes um, that would otherwise not be the case so um, it's it's a wonderful thing I think to, to, to do that um, just as a, a measure in Scotland um, last year um, to, to the end of 29, 2019, there were 500 body donations in Scotland and 250 of those were rejected. Um, the university with the lowest rejection rate was the university that we go to and the reason that they had the lowest rejection rate was because we use those donors who would otherwise be turned away. So it's quite a big, a big aspect. You know, London, all around the country, donors are being turned away uh, on a regular basis. Now, quite what's going to happen at the moment after this remains to be seen. I don't know what the donor program will look like um, or whether people that have had coronavirus will be accepted. Um, probably in the greater scheme of things, um, I, would, I would guess not. Um, I don't know as to why that might be the case. Um, I wouldn't necessarily know when we get a donor if they'd had any other kind of flu um, and also as to whether the flu, the, this coronavirus is going to be prevalent any longer um, than any other kind of virus um, after death. So um, it, it, it remains to be seen. I'd have to take advice on that and I can come back and let you know. So Matt Scarsbrook asks, uh, when it comes to manual therapy, can we really suggest that we can influence any tissues deeper than the adipose layer and accepting that different people have different volumes of adipose tissue but can uh, feel the same benefits from manual therapy, does this not suggest that we are in fact only interacting with the client at a very shallow depth? It's a very good question and it's something that um, you know, is, is, is a fundamental question for me uh, over the years is what is it we're actually doing? Um, and we poke people and rub people and prod people and, and, um, and, and sort of <laughs> um, Oliver Fisk in America says he's a massage therapist and uh, apparently a very good one. I've never had a session from him, hint, hint. But he says, um, I'm going to go off and rub the people. So we rub people, um, poke people, prod people. What are we actually doing? It's very, very hard to say. The stories that we tell about, you know, deep pressure and accessing various structures and releasing bits of certain bits of tissue, I, I'm, I'm not entirely convinced. Um, and unless we can understand what the interface is between our hands and those layers and, and what's going on in there, I think it's, um, I think it's an, a, a difficult thing to say for any, with any degree of certainty that we are having a specific effect on a specific tissue. So definitely it's a, um, a superficial interface um, um, at a very shallow depth. Doesn't necessarily mean to say it doesn't have a huge amount of depth in terms of its outcome, but certainly we are not touching muscle at all. We are touching skin and superficial fascia. Implications for that remains to be seen. So a question from Nikki Mansfield who asks, um, 
considering the deficiency of collagen in severely hypermobile bodies, is it the case that myofascial release is more or less beneficial to hypermobile patients, e.g. those with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome? Should we be doing more myofascial release with these patients or less? Um, I don't have a, a specialty subject in terms of myofascial release. I think the bottom line is, is that referring to my previous question about what is it we're actually doing, um, the idea of more or less is, is a very subjective question. Um, are we having an effect on collagen when we're doing myofascial release? Well, we, we don't know. Um, we are almost certainly affecting the movement of fluid through the tissues, we, that much we can be sure about. Um, depending on the pressure, we can be applying pressure that moves through very small interstitial spaces. Um, and this is something that came up at the, um, at the Fascia Congress last year, and, and the, the idea of the, um, um, the, the, the interstitium idea of moving fluid through it. Um, potentially move, could move, you know, tumours or even infections. I, I don't think it quite works like that, but certainly we are looking at fluid movement and maintenance and the establishment and maintenance of effective fluid movement around the body. As far as collagen is concerned, well, if the fluid is ground substance um, and extracellular matrix within that, then it goes without saying that we're also affecting the way that that's moving around, but within its own compartmental uh, tissues. Are we also helping people to feel better and more positive and um, generally in a better way? Well, yes, I think I think we are. So I, I don't know if there's a clear answer to the more or less question. So again, another question from Matt Scarsbrook. Is myofascial release a misnomer? Can we really release fascia? Do we even want to um, if it's so important, so important structure? Again, I think I think it's terms that we come up with and I think um, that what we're doing is is creating a uh, more space and that's what i would suggest is that we're introducing manual movement you know manual therapists are introducing manual movement and also dealing with proprioception we're dealing with pain interpretation we're dealing with a whole um, neural interface a whole sort of neural feedback remembering that you know pain is an output not an input so um, we're drawing attention to certain parts of the body this came up last night about kinesio taping what do i think kinesio taping is doing well i think it's i think it's proper receptive I think it's it's reminding you to you know hold yourself in a certain way and I think that certain manual therapists do the same releasing a fascia isn't isn't possible because where's it going to go you know if you release something the by implication it goes or it changes deep fascia isn't going to change with our hands it's very unlikely that we're going to be able to apply sufficient pressure or want to apply sufficient pressure or that anybody's going to let us apply sufficient pressure to change deep fascia um, so we're again looking at creating more spaces to allow a better increase of fluid and therefore a better increase in movement um, and uh, reduction in pain and so on and so forth. But no, I don't think it is. Uh, well, it isn't possible to release fascia and um, so is it a misnomer. Yeah, but I think we know what we're talking about. That's the point. And I think in, in the future, moving forward, we have to have a language that makes sense. That's what I would be looking for in terms of um, dealing with, you know, particularly in this crisis where we haven't got um, a hands-on approach. I'm going to be doing a, a, a chat about this, a, a freebie webinar about, you know, how we need to, to re, regroup, if you like, and sort of uh, re-communicate with the public about how, how important touch is. Um, and I think as part of that, it's also perhaps reconfiguring our language and our narrative to say what it is that we're doing. Um, and rather than necessarily making up stories that that aren't grounded in, in fact or science, that we should be honest and go, well, we don't really know what we're doing, but it feels good and people respond well and they get better, seem to get better quicker, um, if that is the case. Mm. So um, Christopher Gibson asked, the knots you feel when you're doing massage and soft tissue work, is that adhesions, um, are they adhesions? And by working on them, does that break them up and allow better tissue movement and reduction in pain? So. Um, we don't, we're not exactly sure, um, and Matt Scarsbrook again, following up from Chris's question, are knots or adhesions ever found in cadavers? And my answer to that is no. Um, I've never seen a knot or an adhesion in a cadaver, but what I have found very much so is things that would feel like that, but not in the muscle. And that's the important thing, and this is what we're going to be covering in our uh, session next week about you know, what, is, what is in our deeper tissues and what isn't in our deeper tissues, what is in our more superficial tissues. So uh, when you break up massage, knots during massage, what are you breaking up? I am pretty sure that you are not 
breaking anything up in relation to uh, muscle or deep fascia. Um, and I'll explain my reasoning for that next week. Um, so um, breaking them up, whatever that means, does it allow better tissue movement and reduction in pain? The answer is yes, I think it does. Um, but again, the reasons that we think that that's the case probably aren't. So again, uh, I'm, I'm calling, you know, I'm, I'm sort of pouring cold water on that theory and I'd like to discuss that. So we will, we will talk about that a, a, a bit, a fair bit. And um, we'll talk about palpation in superficial fascia tissues um, next week. Um, what's the difference between scar tissue and adhesions? Um, it's an interesting question. It's a good question. Thank you for that. That's Brenda Brownwell who's asked that question. So we have scarring. So you, you make a, a cut on something. You, you cut like I've, I've got a, if you can see that there, uh, sorry if the sound's gone, but I had a, um, a collarbone um, plate put in a couple of years ago. Um, I, um, I fell over. I wasn't drunk um, playing cricket, and uh, so I, I will always have that scar tissue. Now, what I want to, we want to avoid within a scar tissue is we want to avoid the surrounding tissues becoming stuck. Um, I will talk a little bit about adhesions in when we get to viscera because I've got some great pictures of, of that. We'll also talk about it again next week. And I know it's you know tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow, manana manana, but we will be talking about that adhesions and showing you what that looks like in superficial fashion next week. So it's when it gets stuck down. Um, and the surrounding tissues can't move, then that's what would be, I would be referring to as an adhesion. But the scar tissue is just basically, you know, you cut through it and you've stitched it all up. And now all those tissues, skin, superficial fascia, deep fascia muscle, you know, however far down you go, are always going to be scarred together, stuck together. You're not ever going to be able to release those or change those um, because they are stitched together. They're like, you know, they're blanket stitched. Um, but um, th it's the surrounding tissue that then gets adhered or stuff that's further down. So I might end up with a scarring on the surface and then deeper into that tissue I might have an adhesion where I've had lack of movement in the area because of the scar tissue. Uh, so I hope that makes sense. Scott White asks, is it, is it possible, Scott White, thank you uh, for your question. So Scott White, thank you for your question. Is it possible to negatively affect fascia from treatment, i.e. too much pressure or frequency? Does fascia have an optimal response time to treatment, chronic versus acute, and therefore better, uh, 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 therefore having a sort of better judgment of a treatment plan? Um, again, what we're doing is we're assuming that, that the pain and the fascia are synonymous, and that's not necessarily the case. Or we're also assuming that the pain that we're experiencing in, in, in a local area um, is from that local area and that it's not influenced from anywhere else. So um, it, it's, it, there's a lot of um, questions within that question that I would have. Um, as with anything, it's, it's possible to damage somebody. You know, you press too hard for too long. Um, I'm very concerned why I've seen people try and do psoas releases pressing through the abdomen uh, for reasons that are, are bonkers, in, in my opinion. And I'll, I'll talk about the, the illogicality of trying to release a psoas in a future webinar. So, so look out for that one, because that's going to be popular. And I'll, and I'll try and tell you what I think the psoas is doing as well, so, um, which isn't what most people think it's doing. Um, so, um, but when you start to press through those layers, and you're aiming for a specific structure, um, well, A, you're not getting to the specific structure because it's not possible, particularly in, in the case of size, and B, you've got, you know, 27 other structures between your fingers and the structure you think you're palpating or getting to. So what effect are you having on those? Um, and that's uh, uh, the, the, the question. Can you damage somebody? Sure, you can damage anybody doing anything badly. Um, and I think um, a lot of the time, the, the potential is to increase inflammation um, by rubbing too hard for too long. And of course, what's gonna happen is you're gonna um, increase the body's ability to, uh, to say, well, we'll, we'll produce some painkillers and it'll, you know, there we go, it stopped hurting. Thank you, please stop doing that to me. Um, but there is nothing that's gonna happen in a treatment session that's gonna change anything, you know, anatomically or physiologically. You're not gonna get, a change in an hour's session. It's not going to happen. You may get somebody that has less pain at the end of the session, but nothing's actually happened. They've just got the brain has switched off that response to that area as far as pain is concerned. You haven't lengthened anything or shortened anything or released anything or changed anything as such apart from brought fluid into an area potentially. So um, what are you trying to do in, in, in 45 minutes of an hour of rubbing somebody? Um, 
my feeling of, of, after 30 years of being in this game is that A, I haven't really got a clue what I'm doing, for sure, in terms of the effect, and B, I think the takeaway is that I think most therapists do too much, you know, particularly in, in, in where they want to fix somebody. There is this des desperate desire that I, as a therapist, um, must fix you. Um, I'm very fortunate enough to work in St Andrews every year, and we have a clinical skills room, and I'm always struck by uh, the number of times people will do work on each other, they'll give each other sessions, it's great to see and it's great to experience. And then people will stand and say to me, right, well, how do you feel? Does he, you know, I have a stiff neck. Um, does that, that feels better, does it, you know, that feel better? Well, hang on, I've had this for 45 years and, and, and I'm pretty sure that, you know, 20 minutes of half an hour of however good you are is not going to change 45 years. Now, you know, in one session, I think it's very unlikely unless you have a God complex. So, you know, if I can see holes in your hands, then we're, we're good to go. But otherwise, I, I think we are um, overestimating our own power and our own ability to, to, to change things in a, in a very short space of time. So, um, and fascia is one of those things. You are going to hurt somebody if you want to try and change their fascia. So, um, um, so to negatively affect fascia from treatment, probably just try not to. Um, Matt Scarsbrook again, he, he asked some great questions. Um, <laughs> so, um, what studies are there that suggest that manual therapy directly affects fluid movement in a clinically significant way? Um, yeah, uh, pff, flu, and Ben Mortlock says, what are, are, are we are fluid influences. Um, are there studies that suggest that, that manual therapy directly affects fluid movement in a clinically significant way? There may not be studies. Um, but I would say this to you, and, and that absence of proof is not the same as proof of absence. Um, and it's fairly obvious um, that you put your hands on somebody and rub them, then you are going to change their fluid dynamics because they are a pressure ball of fluid. And when you press a pressure ball of fluid, the fluid moves. That's the laws of hydrodynamics. Um, as to whether it's clinically significant, Define clinical significance. If clinical significance is somebody with a brief pain inventory saying that they report uh, less pain, better sleep, better quality of life measures, then they are clinically significant measures, yes, and there will be plenty of those around. Um, are we saying that it changes um, you know, um, viral transmission? Well, I, I don't know. Maybe not. You know, there's, there's, lot, there's millions of studies out there on lots of different things, so you, you'd have to look for them. Um, but I would say that, yes, we are fluid influences because you give somebody a hug, you're changing their fluids, you're changing their dynamics, you're changing their blood pressure the way they feel. So we know that touch has a, a huge influence on things like uh, blood pressure. We know that touch has a huge influence on things like infection control um, in relation to the infection rates after surgery. Um, we know that people that get touch before surgery have uh, less time in ICU. So those studies are out there. Um, does that mean to say that we are, what's the word, effect, effect, directly affects fluid movement in a clinically significant way? It, it's asking for a specific outcome, um, and um, it's a mischievous question, but I like the question, I really do. Um, and um, So uh, Thomas Zoranek says, I don't say much about fascia as a current conductor and fascia energetics. Can I say something about this characteristic? Um, so, so the, the, the point about, about fascia as a scaffold, as a space maker, is, is if you create a net through something, um, the net is within a fluid environment. And so the nature of our fluid environment is that it has electrolytes in it, so there is a, um, a, a, there's a bioenergetics through the whole body. And Tim Watson talks about the bioelectrics, that we have an electric field all the way through our body, and that changes through manual therapy, and, and particularly in the pauses. It's why I like Bowen so much. Things change when you take your hands off. So the idea is, is that, you know, of course, we are an electrical structure. All, every single bit of us is an electric impulse. We move our, our arms and our muscles because of an action potential of polarizing and depolarizing um, um, electrical signals and along nerve endings. That's exactly what you know. That's exactly what our function is. So um, of course, anything as far as fascia is concerned and fluid is concerned and, and tension within a fluid dynamic, there's going to be electrical currents moving through that. Um, Perhaps we can look and saying, well, where there's a scar or adhesion, that we get a barrier and a, and a blockage, uh, and that that creates some kind of insula insulating effect, and that it blocks the electrical current pathways. 
I would think that would be logical. It would certainly be logical in terms of the blocking of the movement of fluid. You know, if you put a block in there and block in a, uh, in a um, you know, you dam up a, a stream, you divert the current um, and they divert the current of the stream around. We've all done that as kids at the beach, you know, try to divert the stream coming off. Uh, God knows what was coming out of that outlet, but, you know, divert the stream coming down into the sea and, and pile rocks up around streams. So within a fluid environment, if you put a blockage in there, you're going to change the way that that fluid moves. Um, now, whether it can find its own pathway or not remains to be seen. But if it doesn't, then that's where we might start, start to see adhesions. Does that have um, an influence on uh, current conductor and the energetics of it? Uh, again, I, I, I don't know. Maybe. Test it. Find out. Uh, but I would say that, that, that logic and physics and hydrodynamics would say that probably. Um, so, uh, yeah. Um, um, Michael Andrew asks, what is my opinion on joint and spinal manipulation? Uh, what do you think is happening? Um, what is my opinion on it? I, I had a lot of it over the years. Um, I think it has, it has its place. Um, I think sometimes, in, in certainly when I was a youngster, back in the day, it was done too much too often. And uh, it was, you know, it was one of those things that um, it, it gets repeated. And there is the accusation that uh, certainly for some of the people still doing a lot of high velocity thrust work, that they do um, have a reputation for doing it a lot uh, over a period of time, over a long period of time. Um, and personally, my feeling is if you do anything sort of four, five, six times and you don't get a change maximum, then you might need to reconfigure and, and, and rethink about what it is that you're doing. So if you're continuing to do the same thing, um, without getting a change in results, then I think that somebody defined that as a definition of stupidity. But certainly as far as manipulation, if you like it, then great. I wouldn't do it too often. I think it potentially creates uh, weakness of attachment of, of muscle around the area um, and uh, potentially could lead to um, scarring in, in, in certain areas. But, but I, you know, again, it, it's, it's one of those things that, uh, and if you stop doing it, you know, the implications for that in terms of particularly um, cervical adjustments within football players in America uh, suggested that you have to keep doing it, otherwise you get sort of quite detrimental effects when you stop. So um, it, it's not my cup of tea. I don't particularly want to have it done again. Um, I, if somebody persuaded me to it that I trusted, I might give it a go. But generally speaking, um, I'm, I'm, I've moved on from that and I think that the, the soft tissue approaches um, are the way to go. What do I think is happening? I think Let's not forget that we're not just adjusting a spine or a joint, we're adjusting the soft tissue that surrounds it. If I create a movement in my superficial fascia, in my superficial areas, and I create a sharp movement that creates a, 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 a clicking effect within those tissues, and I can do that, um, would I have the same release and change in relation to functional movement? While well, I've seen that happen, you know, two and two makes it four. Um, and the um, A.L. Raderman reference, I'll, I'll, um, I'll put that out for you. And I'll also put out the um, uh, fascial plasticity document that, um, that Robert from Robert Schleip. So um, thank you so much for all your questions. Amazing questions. Um, your enthusiasm and energy comes across in this. And I hope I've covered them all. If I haven't, um, then, you know, I'm sure you've got uh, lots of research to do uh, yourselves. And um, I look forward to uh, seeing you again next week and, and receiving your questions. By all means, send questions in ahead of time. Um, we do get to said, get some of those um, copied and pasted from the chat and put down into an email for us so we can answer those questions later on. Thanks again. See you next time. Bye for now.